Well, welcome to a new Harry's Garage video. And this one, I'm gonna look at running an electric car, a plug-in hybrid, and a classic car on sustainable fuels. And I've put sustainable fuels in the mix because they have fascinated me since I first heard about them. We heard Porsche announcing that e-fuels out in Chile, I think it was. Are these the answer for us classic car enthusiasts or car enthusiasts? And what are the costs? What is the true in environmental impact of electric car CO2 per kilometre using UK electricity? Same goes for the plug-in hybrid Range Rover. We've had this nearly a year, this P400e. I've been very surprised at how many miles we're actually doing on electric with it. And then the Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow. What happens if I was to run that on sustainable fuel? What's the cost? What's the environmental impact? Is it the answer? So that's what this video is gonna be about. Right, I'm gonna go through a whole load of numbers and I'm gonna kick off with the BMW. Now, you will be seeing a conventional um, Harry's Garage test of this car. So this is the BMW i4 M50. This is the first car from Empower, pure electric car. 80 kilowatt hour battery, I've been using it. I went down to London and back and on a 130 mile drive, it did 2.5 miles per kilowatt hour. That gives us, now this is where the numbers come in, two and a half miles per kilowatt hour. In this area, now I'm gonna, the average today in the UK is 270 grams of CO2 for each kilowatt hour produced. That's the average figure. Unfortunately, where we are in central England, we are more served by gas uh, power stations than renewables, just the location. We have a little bit of solar going on and I haven't got today's figure, but from experience, we are, will be around 400 grams of CO2 for each kilowatt hour produced consumed in this area of Oxfordshire. I'm gonna flash up a map Hopefully by the time I've edited this, I will have a live map, but, but I'm gonna use 400 grams. Now, using that electricity, two and a half miles uh, covered on that unit of electricity, we, this car is emitting the equivalent of 100 grams of CO2 for each kilometer it travels. If you live in other areas of the UK, if you live in Scotland, for example, renewables everywhere, it would be massively lower the figure than um, that 100 grams. You'll probably, it's quite often 40 around there. So divide by four, it'd be 10 grams of CO2 for each kilometer traveled. I'm pointing out if you're charging your car in a highly populated area, um, Birmingham down, Banbury, Oxford, it's a much higher than the average figure for the whole of the UK. Now, in this area, I had a bill come, um, a, quote come through for electricity with this craziness going on with gas prices etc and the terrible things happening in Ukraine the electricity cost per unit they are quoting me is 30 pence per unit do two and a half miles at 30 pence a unit and it will cost you 12 pence per mile to travel in this car. If you're using a, a quick charger somewhere, you pay a lot more for your unit you, of electricity. It could be up to um, 50p, 60p, and then it will be double. So 20, 24 pence per mile to travel in your pure electric car. Now, turning to our Range Rover, P400e. We've had this 11 months now, and it's on just ticked over 13,000 miles. So we're averaging about 1,200 miles a month. And it does everything. We plug it in religiously as soon as we get home. Uh, my grandson lives at home. He's going to school, so it does school run. It does shopping. We go out in it. So it's lots of short journeys and the occasional long journey. And I am amazed at the figures we are getting from this car. For over the last 8,837 miles, this car has averaged 69.1 MPG from a Range Rover. Would never have expected that before we got it. It has a four cylinder, um, two litre petrol engine and a battery that gives it a 24 mile range or thereabouts. Now, what's that when we compare it to the electric car in cost per mile and the actual um, CO2 equivalent? 
the little curveball I've got here, I'm going to ex explain my situation. I put a wind turbine in at the house back in 2007, a six kilowatt uh, wind turbine, and that has produced a lot of electricity. With a windy spot, I've noticed so far in 2022, over the two months, it's produced 1,200 units, so let's call it 600 units of electricity a month. That at, say, two miles per kilowatt is enough to run this for 1,200 miles, but we're not doing 1,200 miles on a pure electric we are doing around 60% of our motoring on electric. That works out at 720 miles of the 1200 on pure electric. I have no cost on that electricity. So this is my cost with this car, with our own generated electricity and fuel at £1.60 a litre, cost per mile for thus in this Range Rover, 10.5 pence per mile, actually cheaper than the pure electric. Now you're all shouting at the screen that if I added in the electric cost at the same cost as the BMW, it would be more. And you are correct. We would be using 360 units of electricity um, at 30p. That adds nine pence per mile for the um, price of this car, running this car. It's actually 19.5 pence per mile. So there you go, lots of numbers of crunch, but much, much closer having a plug-in hybrid compared to an EV car than you might imagine. Oh, I haven't mentioned the CO2. The CO2 of, on the Range Rover at 69.1 mpg, there is a number you use. The magic number is 6760. If you divide 6760 by the mpg, you get the equivalent of how, many, uh, how much CO2 per kilometre. And the number for the Range Rover is 97 grams of CO2 per kilometre. So less, just a smidgen less than the BMW living where we do. Now, what happens when we get to the Rolls Royce? Now, sustainable fuel. What does sustainable fuel, what is it? It's a very intriguing topic, actually. Sustainable fuel from Coruscant, they use ethanol to gasoline method. There is also methanol to gasoline method, which is what Porsche are doing out in Chile. And, and just quickly, methanol to gasoline, basically you use somewhere where there's a huge amount of power. So Chile, all the wind coming off the Pacific or in the Sahara Desert, those of solar power. And then you're taking the CO2 out of the atmosphere and through a process that was actually invented by ExxonMobil many years ago, you can turn CO2 into gasoline with a fuel. Don't ask me about the science, it's a formula, I don't know that bit, but you basically use that power. You, you, and if you're thinking, oh, you could use that, all that power you're generating, and we could plug in, you know, elect, use that electric in the UK, Electricity doesn't travel very well over the, such distances, but if you're turning that raw power you're generating in these unpopulated areas into a liquid um, power source, energy source, that's very transportable, that's the way you bring that renewable power to where we all live and how we all use our power. That's the theory of it. Now, this sustain, which is what they're calling the fuel, is actually produced from biomass waste, is the easy way to describe it. It could be sugar beet tops in the agriculture industry. It could be paper waste. It could be lumber. It's, it's waste product. What they want is starch and sugars goes into ethanol and into gasoline. It's, it's a, quite a complicated process. They, it's rated as a renewable fuel source. This, basically what the trick is with sustainable fuels like this, no fossil fuel in this fuel, so you are not releasing CO2 being, that is locked under the Earth's crust. You're using plant matter that has absorbed the, current, the CO2 in the atmosphere and converting it into fuel. And when I put it into a car, then the tailpipe CO2 is just returning that CO2 that was absorbed by the plant a, a few months ago back into atmosphere. So it's a cycle. 
and the cycle means that you're not actually increasing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. That's the core thing with global warming. If we burn a fossil fuel that's been locked away for millions of years, that CO2 increases the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and you get global warming. Sustainable fuel is harvesting the CO2 in the atmosphere already there, turning it into fuel, we burn the fuel, CO2 goes up, oh, then we consume it again to turn it into fuel and it's a cycle. That's how it works. So this sustainable fuel does seem to be a very good option for running all the cars in here and not worrying about global warming because we're not actually growing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. There is a slight downside at the moment with this fuel and that is it's more expensive than conventional fuel. It's effectively double the price compared to regular unleaded. The main, at the moment, this fuel is been creating great interest in the motorsport division. You would have seen that, uh, especially in lower racing in this year's Dakar Rally in that fantastic car that ProDrive developed on this fuel. That is actually Appendix J as its term. So that's a racing fuel. What I'm talking to Croyton about is a fuel that I can replace and run in all these classics. And I'm going to be working with Croyton Fuel over the next few months, developing this fuel that's right for all the cars in the garage, because I'm really fascinated and I want a sort of guilt-free use of all the toys. I, if I look at that Ferrari Testarossa or the F40 or the 911, those cars have an indefinite life. This Rolls-Royce was produced over 50 years ago. Engine hasn't rebuilt, it's perfectly serviceable. And if I can then run it on a fuel that has no damaging effect on the atmosphere, isn't that what we're all after? And so I am really keen on working this. There is a downside, as I say, the cost of the fuel. The cost per mile, if I put it in this Rolls-Royce, we say three pounds a litre at the moment, well, I'm up to 80 pence a mile to run my Rolls Royce on that fuel, but it only does a thousand miles a year, say. So 800 pounds to run this Rolls Royce for the year and no growth in CO2 into the atmosphere, no release of um, global warming gases, extra gases. And I always come back. It's so much noise there on this subject, I find. And I always try and simplify it and say, what will the planet, will it notice if I make this change? If I buy that electric car, will it notice an improvement? Well, the answer where I live in Oxfordshire and is because the d domestic electricity grid supplies me quite dirty electricity because I'm nowhere near the renewable areas. There is, the planet wouldn't really notice me running around in that electric car. The reduction in CO2 is not great. But what the planet will notice, and I haven't discussed yet, is the construction of all these new electric cars. We, we seem to ignore it, but there's no way the planet ignores it. Making an electric car is energy intensive. It releases an awful lot of CO2 just purely during the manufacturing. Now, Manufacturers are trying to get around this and BMW are trying harder than anybody to reduce the amount of CO2 during the construction of that car. But there's, the planet will notice that all these new cars coming out. There's no escaping that a battery in particular is highly energy intensive. It uses a lot of energy to, to manufacture. That means a release of a lot of CO2. And we have to watch that. If you care about the planet, we actually should be keeping these cars longer. And there's no better example than perhaps this Rolls Royce that's 52 years old and still going. So what we can't say is an electric car is zero emission. When it comes to the running costs, I can get round that by producing my own power. Yes, I've got the turbine for the house. I'm now also looking at solar panels, 30 kilowatt system. If you watch my farming channel, you'll get to hear more about that. But for me, the plug-in hybrid, while we're in this process of transition to an electric future, I actually like the electric sensation of doing miles in traffic around here, the silence, I like that bit. I detest the inconvenience of having to charge it away from home and 
all the horror stories and the charges not working and the hour and something um, to charge up. I don't want that. And I, and I just think we're not actually curing the planet for uh, climate change by all moving to electric until we have the supply of electricity a whole lot cleaner, greener than it is at the moment. And, it's, and I look at that BMW, it's 2.3 tonnes it weighs and it's given me a range of under 200 miles in my experience with that car. I think we've got to get it better. That Range Rover, I can fill up with electricity and petrol and do 400 miles and I go on a long journey and I can refill it with fuel and that's fine. And then I do my local journeys wherever I'm arriving and it's on electric, all on electric and I come back. So I just think we've got to look at that technology. It's a bit like your mobile phone. It's not only a phone, it's a camera uh, as well. It's a calculator, it's a connection to the web. That is a multi-purpose vehicle, a plug-in hybrid compared to a sole purpose with the electric car that does one, one job, but it is very dependent on how fast you can charge it, etc. But sustainable fuels, will they allow me to run my fleet of classic cars forevermore? This isn't going to wear out. How many electric cars of today are going to be around in 52 years time like this Rolls Royce? Don't think many. I think we're going to have a technology change that's going to really change how we use our electric cars. But we're not there yet and we're not got clean electricity in the UK yet. We're not all renewable. Maybe it's down to us to put more solar panels in ourselves and then charge like that. I don't know. So there you go. You're going to be hearing a lot more about sustain and Croydon fuels on Harry's Garage. Because for me, on my classic cars, this I think is the answer. I'm going to be working on them, developing the right fuel to run the classics. And you're going to see it in motorsport sort of thing as well. So there you go. A different sort of video. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have, keep watching, keep subscribing. More videos coming along very soon.